How's it going? Woo, DevOps. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Kaufman. I'm a developer advocate for IBM, and I'm really excited to be talking to you guys today about building cognitive applications. Specifically, we're going to focus on creating visualizations using cognitive and machine learning based APIs. This session is going to be broken up into four parts. Uh, we're we're going to start with, with a discussion on what it means to be cognitive. Then we're going to look at some demo apps. After that, we're going to create our own visualization from scratch. And then, if time permits, we can have a discussion on transitioning a deterministic application to a more cognitive-based solution. All right, so what is cognitive, right? Well, to start off, no one really knows. It's a, it's a, it's a fairly ambiguous term. In fact, Wikipedia... Uh, is quick to point out that this is, in, in fact, a buzzword created by IBM. Right? So cognitive computing, a buzzword and computing concept by IBM, aims at making human kinds of problems computable. Right? So perhaps a better definition of, of this term would be cognitive systems are probabilistic. They generate not just answers to numerical problems, but hypotheses, reasoned arguments, and recommendations about more complex and meaningful bodies of data. Right? So what does any of this mean? So... It's about, it's about this point where people sort of start to make this association between this word cognitive and this concept of machine learning. Right? Are, they, are they equal? Are they not? Um, and so I would venture to say that they are not equal, but in fact, machine learning is a small subset of these cognitive systems. In fact, there are, there are more components, right? So in a, in a cognitive system, we're, we're going to have to use machine learning with a large heap of unstructured data to sort of create insight. Uh, and this sort of goes back to that second definition of creating these probabilistic hypotheses and recommendations. So a cognitive system versus a deterministic system. In a deterministic system, developers have to build this sort of complex state machine representing their app. And that state machine, you know, it has your application state, it has different views, you have your user navigating it, uh, but everything's sort of planned out for you. In a more cognitive system, right, um, you just have this heap of unstructured data, and the system itself learns and uh, creates these probabilities for you, right? And so this sort of leads us to what we're going to re re refer to as a cognitive spectrum, where you can have things that are, you know, sort of more basic, mildly cognitive, and things that are very deeply cognitive, and perhaps those don't even exist yet, right? In this talk, we're really just going to look at more mildly cognitive things, because that's what we can build today. But there are some examples of deeply cognitive apps that I want to discuss uh, right in the beginning. So one of them is uh, we've been doing research with Watson and many other medical uh, institutions, right? So with Sloan Kettering and the Cleveland Clinic. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, you know, there are thousands and thousands of medical journals that come out every month. And it's simply beyond the scope of human knowability to, to read all of these, right? So we're able to design these systems that can read things in real time, and going back to those probabilistic hypotheses, suggest um, diagnoses or, or suggest further actions to help doctors with their work. There's also research being done with the USAA. Uh, and here, this, this aims to help soldiers transitioning from soldier life back to civilian life. Again, there's a heap of unstructured data coming out every single day. People are writing about uh, pain points and, and, and what happens to them. So we're able to design these systems to help soldiers transitioning. And lastly, we have HAL. And this is a joke, right? We can laugh, ha, ha, ha. By the way... There are, there are about eight jokes, and you're not allowed to leave until you laugh at all of them. Uh, that was number two, so thank you. And so we live in this, in this pretty exciting time because developers no longer need to be intimately familiar with uh, the core concepts of machine learning to build applications, right? So companies like IBM and Google and Amazon are releasing these as APIs for you, uh, so that you can build apps yourself. Specifically, Watson is broken up into a series of 19 different discrete APIs. <clears throat> and these cover everything from natural language processing to speech-to-text and text-to-speech to different visual APIs and different analytics-based APIs. 
And so with these, while, while each of them solve this sort of micro problem, we could stitch them together to build insight, right? So we could sort of imagine piecing the speech to text service to some tone analyzer, right? So a, a user can interact with the system with their voice. We then convert that to text. We can analyze it, uh, extract some concepts, feed that into the dialogue service, maybe look things up, and then convert it back to speech. And using something like this, we can create either a chat bot or maybe some kind of Siri-like thing, right? OK. So the first demo that we're going to look at is this rather simple application. Well, let me just jump over to it here. So this is an app called uh, Election Insights. And what's going on here is it's doing natural language processing on news articles in real time, if it loads. Here we go. Uh, so sorry that the colors aren't quite great on this screen, but what's happening is we have this spectrum of blue to red, from positive to negative, and different size of different bubbles, right? So what this represents is uh, both entity extraction and sentiment analysis done by different APIs. And so I was able to build this as a simple web developer, right, with no real machine learning experience, but we can still use it to gain insight into what's happening. All right, so we could then change the date range. And I guess things are going a bit silly, right? But so here we can see how sentiment is changing over time. And so uh, this was a rather interesting problem to solve. So we're going to look into what went into creating this visualization. So the application itself is a node server and client code. The node server goes off to Alchemy API, which we'll be looking into the query and the response data from that later. Alchemy goes off to the news, which is when we do the sentiment an analysis, et cetera. Right? We're going to take the results from that and cache it in a Mongo database, and we'll discuss why we did that later, too. And then the client code is split between React and D3. And this section up here is running in our platform as a service called Bluemix, and we'll be doing another demo of that uh, later in, in the session. So Alchemy API, what they do, uh, is pretty great natural language processing. And they have this service called Alchemy News, which is sort of a demo in and of itself. And what Alchemy News is, is they run their natural language processing on the news articles, and then you can query their database. Right. So the, the query that we're sending off looks like this. Uh, so as part of their service, they're, based on uh, machine learning, building this taxonomy for us. And when they do that, uh, the, the uh, API assigns a confidence level in uh, that breakdown. Right? So what this query is saying is, within your taxonomy, give me things uh, about the election with the score greater than 0.75. So this goes back to that earlier point of the probabilistic hypothesis, right? So these systems, what they're doing is they're creating this data, but they're also assessing how confident they are in themselves. So when we do that, we get this pretty ugly block of JSON. Uh, and the first thing that we're, that we're going to do is we're going to break out the entities, right? So within each article, we're going to get things that look like this. President, who was mentioned three times, uh, and then it gives us this sentiment on a scale of negative one to one. And so we're going to put these in a, in a Mongo database that we can map reduce over it. And then we're going to perform six steps of manipulation on this data. The first thing that we need to do is query the entities by the date, which is that you know, time bar on the top of the app. Then we need to group them by the text. We need to average the sentiment, which is going to determine the color of the bubble. Then we're going to sum up the count, which represents the size of the bubble. Then we're going to sort them by the sum count, right? And then limit to an arbitrary number, which is that slider on the bottom. And so the issue with traditional MapReduce is that you can't sort by the value of, of the reduce, right? You can only sort by the keys. Uh, but thankfully, Mongo has this notion of what's called the aggregation pipeline. And the aggregation pipeline is essentially a subset of optimized functions that you can use to map reduce your data. But because uh, they limit you to, to pre-specified functions, you can't use your own mapping function, for example, 
that they limit you to things like sum and average, etc. Um, it's highly optimized, and, you, and they do allow you to sort by the value. So those six steps, we can, actually, we can actually represent in one line of code. That code looks like entity.aggregate. So the first thing that we do is we match it by the date. We then group uh, by the text so that we can, you know, everything that says president is matched together. And while we're doing this, we can say simply sum the count and average the sentiment. We can then sort by value descending and limit to whatever is passed into our function. And so with one line of code, we're able to create the data that our application needs to produce this visualization. And that's pretty cool. But because that's rather, I just spoke a lot about code, and it's sort of hard to you know, conceptually picture what's happening, uh, here's a, a, a quick little visualization, right? So we have these articles, and each article has, has an assigned date. The first thing that we do is we query by the date. Right, so we get rid of the ones that don't match. Uh, so looking at what entities are in each of these articles, uh, we then break them out of the article, but remember where the date is. We then group them by their text. right? And then we're going to average the count, or sum up the count and average the sentiment, and then sort them. right? So the next visualization I want to quickly look at is this other app. You might notice that I also wrote it because it looks very similar. <laughs> I like bubbles, right? Uh, so what's happening here is we're going to try to correspond uh, changes in stock value to the sentiment being talked around them. Right, so if we, if we click on one of these, it does uh, a, a, a very similar thing to what's happening with the election insights. Uh, and we can also do a join on two different companies. Right? So we can if it loads. <laughs> there we go. All right, so now we're looking at entities being discussed uh, in both of the companies that we select. So this is cool, but this wasn't exactly the, uh, didn't give us the insight that we, that we were hoping for. So we also built uh, this application called Portfolio Insights. And what this app allows us to do, refresh it, um, is we're going to graph the stock value against uh, the average sentiment for that day to see if there's any correspondence here. So this is actually tapping into the exact same database from the Stock Insights app. Um, and it's doing a, a very similar map reduce to what we discussed with the Elections app, except it's averaging everything for a given day and plotting it against the value. So this is another simple way that we could tap into these APIs right, and sort of extract some insight. Like, is, is the sentiment in the news directly correlated with the stocks, or is it not? All right, and those are publicly available. You can hit them at these links. I'm going to, uh, at the end of the session, there will be a slide that has all these links. So now that we're sort of familiar with these concepts of uh, using these APIs to, to do fun things with, we're going to build our own. Close these tabs. All right, so we're going to build them using Bluemix, which is our platform as a service. Uh, and so, just a quick tangent on what Bluemix is, right? Um, so, Bluemix allows application developers to deploy things to the cloud very simply. You can either deploy your app in a Cloud Foundry runtime or as a Docker image. If you deploy your app as a runtime, you literally push your source code to our cloud. Uh, the platform then sets up the environment for you. It does all the networking and all those fun things. Uh, everything is then blank as a service, right? So we have Watson as a service, which are the APIs that we'll be using and the APIs that we've already discussed. Different services for mobile apps, et cetera, right? Too many to go through right here. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to use Node-RED. And what Node-RED is, is it's an open source project that allows you to visually program function blocks to create cool things pretty quickly. Um, and so taking a step back, the application that we're going to build, we're going to try to make a fun little visualization that uses the Watson Tone Analyzer and is going to convert that into color. And so the first thing that we do is we name our app. We deploy it. 
And as this process takes uh, a minute or two, instead of just watching a spinner go as it's deploying our things, I went ahead and pre-did this, right? So over here, we have our Dev DevOps node red flow. And I've gone ahead and added the, the, the uh, tone analyzer service to it so that we could get up and started. Right, so when we hit the app, the first thing that we see is a sort of an introduction to how to use Node Red. And there's, and there's great documentation. Um, and if we have time at, at, at the end, I could sort of go through it. But it has this, this nice little fun button to go to our Node Red editor. So just to get a sense of what Node Red can do, the first thing that we're going to do is define an HTTP input. We're going to give it an endpoint for reasons that will be clear in a second. Uh, and, and then we can define an HTTP response. And all we have to do is wire them together. So right now, this is pretty boring. It's not going to send anything. So what we'll do is we'll put a template node in the middle. Can you guys see? Should I zoom? Yes, no? Zoom, yeah. Let me move these over. I'll just leave that here. Right, so in our, in our template, we could say, uh, we could say, hi, DevOx. Right, so now when we deploy this app, if we hit that endpoint, it says, hi, DevOx. So we can make this more interesting by adding a function block. And in the function block, we can pass query parameters and use them in the template. Right, so we could say pass in our message payload, uh, the previous message requests query params, and we can call something.txt. And I think I might have made a typo there, but it's all good because I have some of this pre-saved on my clipboard in case I mess up. So in here, we could now pass in the previous message's payload. And let's see if I did that properly. We can now say text equals hi. Okay, so it would appear I did not make a typo. And there, we can zoom in. So, ooh, zoomed in too much. All right, so now we're, we're going to make things interesting by adding that tone service. And just so that we get a sense of what this is going to give us, we can add a debug node over here. Right? We can plug this in, say, hey, let's look at what the response of that tone service is going to be. Right, so now when we hit it, it's passing the text into the tone service. And we can see that it's going to give us fun things. Right? So it's going to give us anger. We see that we have anger. We have disgust. We have fear. We have joy, and it's giving us all these qualities about the tone of the text being passed in. Um, and so to do something interesting with that, we're going to try to visualize this tone as, as a color. Right. So let's create another function block. And here, as that object is rather complicated to parse, I went ahead and I pre-wrote uh, this function, and all this is doing is it's going in to uh, this object over here and assigning them all to variables, right? So anger is you know, the first thing in this array, dot tones, et cetera, the score. And then we're simply just going to return this very clean object that is just going to be anger, disgust, fear, joy, et cetera, right? So now if we look at the payload of what this is returning, we can see that we have this nice and simple object that is giving us uh, all the qualities in the tone. And so in creating this demo, I realized that there is no good way to directly turn tone in, into color. But I tried, right? So uh, essentially what I did, very hacky. It's not the best. You can maybe improve this on your own later but I tried to assign different attributes to different RGB values. 
right? So this, this code is saying, in R, you know, let's, let's average anger, in, or anger and fear. And for G, let's do openness, agreeableness, and disgust, right? If it's more disgust, it should be green, maybe. And blue can be sad. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're just going to return this RGB object. Right, so if we look at the response from here, it's now going to convert that in, into this nice, clean RGB object. So the last step is to sort of turn this into a, a color. And so again, uh, I pre-wrote this, right? But what this is doing is it's just making a div uh, and using the same template style. It's just RGB, RGB, right? So it's just literally converting that. And it's going to show the text. Right, so now if we said something like, I'm so sad and it's raining, it's blue-ish, right? Or if we say something like, I'm really angry and going on a rampage. Ooh, orange, yeah, that's pretty angry. Or like anger, anger, anger. Right, that's going to be red. Uh, so <laughs> again, the uh, exact algorithm leads a lot to be desired, but you can see how we quickly created uh, something that is rather complex using APIs that exist for us. We could go a step further. Um, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. And build a more, uh, one second, let me just zoom in real quick. So what we're going to do now is try to make this more interactive. And how we're going to do that is we're going to sort of do something very similar, but we're going to use web sockets, right? just to make it more fun. And so what that's going to do is allow multiple tabs or multiple clients to communicate their tone with color um, to each other. And so I apologize that this is Node. I'm a Node person. I'm not a Java person. Uh, but we're going to do this rather, rather quickly. Um, so it's going to be pretty fun. So the first thing that we're going to need to do uh, is I went ahead and, and I pre-deployed a Node app called Tone. And I bound the node service or the or the tone service to it. So the first thing that we need to do is is get the credentials from this. Uh, it's got to reload it. I love a good spinning wheel, you know. Right. So we're gonna get uh, the username and password from this service, so that we can authenticate with Watson. OK, so if we start up our, our server, can you read that or make it bigger? No, we're good? We'll see it, it doesn't do anything, right? So the first thing that we need to do is actually have our server listen on our port. It's going to take a callback function, and we'll just do a fun little message that says, hi. All right, so now if we start it up, it says, hi. And so all this is doing is it's serving our, our index file, which also does nothing. I, I pre-wrote the CSS because no one wants to see anything about CSS, really. Uh, but all it is is it's a form. And I uh, pre-went in and got references to the DOM elements because that's also rather boring to watch someone do. Right, so if we hit our server, we'll see that we just have this little box that says send. Okay, So now that that's working, we need to go in, and we're going to hook up our WebSocket. Uh, so we're using this library called Socket.io, which makes things very fun and easy. Uh, so all we need to do is say, hey, when we connected, we're going to get a reference to our socket. Um, and then the sockets are going to or communicate with each other using simple pub sub. Right? So we can say, we'll define a topic called tone message. This is going to give us reference to the text that's being passed. And right now, just to make sure that everything's wired up properly, we're just going to print the text. 
And then over on the client side, what we're going to need to do um, is set up an event when our form is submitted. All right, so we're going to say form at event listener submit. It's going to take a function with the event object. Uh, and for annoying JavaScript reasons that I don't want to get into, we have to prevent default behavior. Uh, we're then going to say socket.emit um, tone message. And we're going to pass it the value of what's in the input. And then we should clear what's in the input. And then for more annoying JavaScript reasons, we have to return false. Uh, so if we restart that, hopefully it's going to work. Does this work? It does not work. So that's exciting, right? So let's see if there's an issue here. <laughs> ah, interesting, interesting. Well, luckily, I went ahead and I have this so I can copy and paste it just in case I needed to. And it looks like I did need to. Uh, it would appear that I wrote connected instead of connection. So tricky. So tricky, JavaScript. Uh -huh. So now it's printing. Okay. So the, the next step that we need to do is we're going to take this text and pass it to our tone servers. So what that's going to look like, um, so for all of, all of the Watson services, what we've done is we've made SDKs for different languages. So there's a Node SDK, uh, there's a Java SDK, there's a Python SDK to help developers uh, build things rather quickly. So this is using the Node SDK, which we required in up here. And it's what we passed our, our credentials. Right, so the method is toneanalyzer.tone. We just need to pass it that text. And that's going to return us uh, an error object or a tone object. And so uh, once we have this, we have to send it back to our client. So we're going to use io.emit. And we'll create a new topic called tone, because now we have the tone. We're going to pass it the text. And we're going to pass it a color. And so what we'll do is we'll define a function called calculate color that takes that tone object. So right now, you know, just for fun, uh, we'll declare this down here. Calculate color. It takes the tone. And we'll just return an RGB string to make sure that things are wired up. I don't know, 48, 63. Sounds good. And then on our client side, we need to intercept that event, right? So we're going to go socket dot on tone, right? So now we have reference to the tone object. And all we're going to do is we're going to set the text somewhere on the page so that uh, other clients can see what's being analyzed. Um, Message.text. And then we're just going to set the color in, in the background. All right, so if we start this up, theoretically, this is going to work. Theor. Aha, but of course it didn't work. Oh, there we go. All right, cool. And if we open multiple tabs, we can see that we can pass info between them. Right. So now the last bit is to implement this calculate color method. And what we're going to do is um, the same thing that we did in our node red flow, which is we're just going to say, you know, these certain things are going to contribute to yellow, to red, to green, and to blue. And then we're just going to return that and hope and hope for the best. All right, so now, oops, if we write something like sad, sad, crying, rain, it's going to go and, and, and be blue. And if in a, a new tab we say something like happy and skipping through a meadow of flowers, it should be yellowish, maybe. OK. I'll take green. I'll take it. Um, and so we have this nice, this nice uh, client communication happening. So the last step is we want to get this application running 
on the cloud so that multiple people can interact with that. So all we need to do, the name of this app is Tone, uh, is I went ahead, and the way that you push applications to Bluemix is uh, using this open source project called Cloud Foundry. And in Cloud Foundry, it's rather simple. You just have to define a manifest file that says, hey, this is the services that I want to use. Uh, use the node build pack. This is the command that you're going to use to start my app. I want one instance and allocate 256 megabytes for it. And then once we're authenticated, which I assume that you don't want to watch me type in my password, all we have to do is go see a push name of app, which in this case is Tone. And what this is going to do is it's going to take the files from this directory and push them to Bluemix. And then Bluemix is, is, is going to see, using this uh, build pack, hey, we want to use a node app. And it knows how to run node apps. It knows that it needs to go into package.json and install all the dependencies. And it also knows that I defined uh, this command to start the app, npm start, which is just going to kick off the server. right? So we can watch it doing this. Uh, it takes about 30 seconds. But then once it's up and running, this app is going to be live at this URL, uh, tone.eu-gb.mybluemix.net. So if you guys want to hit this URL, you could put stuff on the screen. It might be a bad idea for me, uh, but we can try it if you want to. If you don't want to, that's OK, too. I won't be offended. All right, so now we see uh, it finished its routine. It installed all, all the things. And the last thing that it has to do is uh, kick off that start command, and it's going to run the health check. All right, so now the app has started. So I'm going to go to this URL. Might be a bad idea. I don't know. We'll find out. We'll see what you guys type. Uh, if no one's going to do it, that's fine. That's OK. Just let me know. Is anyone going to do it? Should we see? Yeah, we got one. Cool. Uh, right. So what we've done is we've <laughs> dog poop is green. I knew that this was dangerous. <laughs> Maybe I should end this soon. Um, so what we were able to do is, is rather quickly <laughs> develop uh, an application that is taking these cognitive APIs and turning them into, uh, albeit simple, visualization. Right. <laughs> Yay. All right. I'm going to go back to the keynote. I'm sorry. If there's time at the end, I could, I could throw this back up. All right. So now that we have a better sense on how to use these cognitive APIs, let's take a, 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 a different ap approach and see how they differ from uh, rather cognitive solution or de deterministic solutions. So we're going to take an example and just look at a hypothetical shopping app, right? So we've all probably encountered something like this at some point in our lives, uh, right? We have a search bar, some kind of faceted search results, and some items. And we can add them to our account and cart. And I chose this example not because it's the best example ever, but because we're all familiar with it. Right? So maybe we could search, and we can go through and narrow things down. And so. An application like this can be represented in a state machine, right? Uh, we have different possible states that our app can be in, and the user is going to navigate uh, through it, right? So you can create different workflows. And the, as developers, what we need to do is, is figure out how these things work together and try to mitigate as many bugs as possible, right? Um, so to make this cognitive, we might just think, hey, you know, let's take one of these blocks and make it smart. All right, so let's take search. Let's go through and let's make our search. It's going to learn. It's going to use NLP. It's going to have crazy good autocomplete. It's going to be an all-around awesome search block. And so the question from here is, is this now cognitive? And I would venture to say that no. Or maybe it's on the end of mildly cognitive uh, in the uh, spectrum that we defined earlier. Right, and the the reason for that is because the application is still deterministic, right? We still have to represent it in uh, this rather crazy state machine. There's something happening over there. Oh boy. Um, 
And so even though we've made our app smarter, it's still, we still re require our developers to pre-program every single flow that the user can take. So I would venture to say that uh, the state machine for a rather, or for a more cognitive app would be this. It, it, it would be simple. We would have user interaction, and it, uh, it would go into our app brain, and then the user would interact again. And so I'm no, I'm no great UX designer, so I have no idea what the UX for this would look like if not using voice, right? So the way that uh, applications and apps and all this stuff work currently, when you download something on your phone or on, or, on, or on your computer, you have to learn how to use it, and you have to fit your behavior to it. But if we were to build something more cognitive, uh, the application would respond to us. And everybody knows uh, you know, how to interact with speech or text, right? Uh, cool. So the UI for this might, might look something like this, right? So in, in this system, what we're doing is we're able to have this sort of free-form, non-deterministic um, interaction with the app still uh, uh, while accomplishing what we need to do. And so that's the majority of what I have prepared for you. Um, uh, I sort of brushed over some, some things rather quickly, if you'd like me to go back and, and we could discuss them in full, right? Uh, so some of those things were what Bluemix really is. We could discuss more of what the Watson services available to people are. Uh, I could take questions. I see you have a question. So this is it's going to have this sort of be a, a more free form uh, final ten minutes for you guys. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I personally am not familiar with the back end of what's happening within the tone service. Oh, so just to re re repeat the question to everyone. So the question was, how actually is the tone service implemented, right? And then beyond that, uh, can it detect something like sarcasm? And so uh, just in my usage of it, I would say that it cannot detect sarcasm yet, right? It's not any of the metrics that we're looking for. Um, yeah, yeah, we have some other IBM here, so you can, yeah, absolutely. So uh, the way is that um, at the back end, you are doing relationship extraction. You are uh, understanding how the different keywords are structured together. So the context is known. So the processing algorithms at the back end can understand what the tone is. And that's what specifically the tone analyzer is for, to know based on the context of All right, good. Any, yeah. I was just going to ask if like, Google Translate is computer processing. What was that? Is Google Translate computer processing? I mean, so uh, just to go back to my first, cognit or my first comment, which is there's no real concrete definition of cognitive yet. Um, but Google Translate does learn over time, right? And it does get better. Uh, but I would venture to say because it isn't at least surfacing in, in, the, in the UI its own confidence in its answer, uh, that it's not cognitive by, by our definition of it, right? Because if you go back to, uh, I mean, everyone likes to bring up when Watson played Jeopardy back in 2005 or six. 
what made that system rather revolutionary was as the system was was looking things up um, and and getting answers, it would say, "Hey, I'm 80% confident. I'm gonna I'm gonna buzz in and answer," or "Hey, I'm only 20% confident. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip this one." Right. So, to my knowledge, Google Translate uh, isn't doing this assessment of its own answer, um, which isn't to say that it's very good, right? It is a, a, a great translation service. Uh, I was in France last week, and I wouldn't have survived without it. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, then my mistake, then yeah, yeah, we could put it, we could put it on the spectrum, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, does uh, Watson have any APIs for extracting facts, like triples, out of text? For example, if you threaded a Wikipedia article, could it tell you that a certain person attended a certain college kind of thing? Would it would extract the text out of, the facts out of? Yeah, so actually um, in the Alchemy API uh, natural language processing, it builds these things called relations for you. Uh, I close the tab. And so actually what's happening in um, the Stock Insights example is these sentences on the right, uh, which are summarizing these articles, are actually constructed by the algorithm itself. Right. So this is reading the news article, and it gives you... Uh, this, these nice little summaries. I mean, not all of them are perfect, right? Because it's still a machine creating it. Uh, but depending on the API that you're using, it can either pull out subjects and nouns or, or create sentences for you. And so then you, on top of that, could build this analysis of, hey, this noun comes up a lot, or this subject comes up a lot, or this verb comes up a lot. Let me, let me look into that and try to build something smart with that. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not really familiar with this, but it looks like you can use APIs to create your own and export them. As could you potentially create another one? I mean, you can build whatever you want, right? So uh, Watson services 19 publicly available APIs, and what you do with those is sort of up to you. Um, like you could, if you wanted to build uh, this awesome service that combines them in this unique and clever way and then make that publicly available for people to use, you could, right? Has anybody on Watson, is there an arbiter of those rumors? Because if you were to be preventing somebody from maliciously <laughs> something wrong, it's a three. Yeah, you mean, uh, yeah. Um, so it, it, it depends on the service that you're using. Some of the services, oh, sorry, I keep on forgetting to repeat the question. But this question was, is there a sort of gatekeeper for what enters Watson's brain, right, and what it can do? Um, and it depends on the service. For some services, you train it yourself and you feed it your own data. Uh, and some services come pre-trained for you. For the pre-trained services, absolutely, it is, uh, you, you, you can't really... Um, you know, make make Watson uh, curse a lot, right? Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, there's a question in the back. So, the question is, how would you uh, uh, test this, right? So, if you're building an application using this, how would you test it? Um, this is something that I haven't thought about until right now. So, <laughs> uh, for some of the pre-trained services, um, you just sort of have to have to trust that they're doing what they say. As far as testing your own app that's using them, you could you know save mock data and test your app that way. Um, but for the ones that you train yourself, I can't on the spot think of any great automated way to test it other than just using it and being like, does this make sense? Which isn't a satisfying answer, and I'm, I'm sorry for that. But if you hit me up on, on Twitter in a, in, a, in a few hours, I'm sure I'll have a great answer. <laughs> I'm getting from Watson speech to text 
Yeah, so, uh, no, 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 it's fine. Discussion is great, right? Um, so to answer that specific question about translating in, into color, um, it's something that I, you know, probably spent too long in thinking about. Uh, and there's really so many variables, right? Because all, all the four-line algorithm that I wrote did is it just, you know, converts these values into RGB things. Uh, but something else that you should probably do if you wanted to make a more comprehensive algorithm would be to use one of the concept insights or concept uh, services, right? And look at the original sentence and see what's being mentioned too, right? Because if someone mentions some, a specific word or a specific color, you might want to predefine some values for that, right? So there are ways that we could use these other services to enhance this rather hacky algorithm. Uh, I forgot what the first part of the question was, but if that's it, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Sorry, I can't hear you. That um, so the so the question was uh, specifically about uh, the language the language classifier service, and it's one that I personally haven't used, so I don't want to give you misinformation. But if you come talk to me afterwards, we could pull up the docs and see. It, every every service is incredibly well documented, and they are pretty easy to use because of that. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question was specifically about using Node-RED. So Node-RED isn't, isn't specific to Bluemix. It's an open source project um, that is a Node app that allows you to, to wire these things together. And if you just go to nodered.org, uh, there's also great docs for that, right? Uh, so on, on nodered.org, they have nice getting started guides. They have... Um, you know, how it's built, and, and, and they sort of walk you through creating these flows. Yeah, so we only have two minutes left. Uh, I could take one more question, or if you want to play with, with the tone thing again, I can throw that back up. It's up to you. Let's do that. <laughs> cats, cats, cats. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the, the question revolved around creating correlations between different uh, sort of data sets on Bluemix. And for that, so what Watson really excels at is more natural language processing things. But within uh, Bluemix, we do offer a, Apache Spark as a service. And if you do that, you can define your own machine learning algorithm. You could say, here are my data sets, and you can build this complex flow using Spark, which is a, a great tool. Yeah. All right, and if that's it, uh, thank you guys.